so, so much more tendencies and capacities. I mean, the human body has an infinite number of capacities. Think of it, think of it that way, this way. Evolution gave us, by making our bodies upright, it liberated the hands from their locomotive uh, function, and, their board, uh, and that's, you know, it deterritorialized the hands, so now they could do all kinds of different things, but at the same time, territorialize the feet. Because now we cannot grab things like monkeys do. You know, monkeys can use some their feet. Can. Some people can. That painter, you know, there's a famous painter in a movie that the guitar didn't have any hands. Yeah. You know, but you need to practice a lot to bring your feet back. And most people's feet are like now tied to the earth, territorialized in contact with the earth. They cannot do anything else. Well, I mean, playing football and stuff, and you can you kind know, of give them a certain kind of you know English. <laughs> But the hand, compared to that, the hand is an amazing thing. It can swim, it can play violin, it can play piano, it can write, it can do all kinds of things, right? And so evolution gave us this upright posture with a consequent feature realization of the hand and a territorialization of the feet. But the amount of things that the hands could do could not possibly be predicted back then. Think of, for instance, a circus. In a circus, you can get the human body to do juggling. That does not, has not evolutionary value whatsoever, and yet it is a capacity, it's a thing that the hands can do. You can also do tightrope walking. What the hell is that useful for? I don't know. But in circles, people do it. And everybody goes, oh my God. You, know, you can also do trapeze arts. You, know, you can hang and then jump and jump with the next trapeze, and there's just three people in a chain, and so on and jump. Circuses are social spaces in the outskirt of town in which the capacities of the body to do all kinds of bizarre things are put in clear display. In other words, the capacities of the human body are really truly infinite. It's just a matter of inventing new things for it to do. So clearly, when you're dealing with infinite economies, the mathematics of, of you know, metals and, and, and tissue and so on are going to become totally useless. So all sort of statistical observations of humankind really are, we can throw away. I mean, if, if what well, you're saying, if there are so not many necessarily, infinite variables. Not necessarily. There are certain things, for instance, the distribution of heights in a population. The distribution of heights in a population, if you take a, a poll or every, you know, you go measure every single person in Saspe and write down their height, and this axis represents a, how high they are, and this is number of people that have that height, or I'm, I'm sorry, vice, vice versa, number of people of a particular height versus what the height is, the curve will always look like this. Yeah, but height is such a simple behavior. Well, I know, I know, that's what I'm saying. You know, but, but for the simple ones, you yeah. can. For the simple ones, can there will be an average height, and there will be some very short people, and there will be some very tall people. So for certain things, you can do it. Mathematics comes short, so the only the only way that we're going to fix that is through math is by putting mathematics into action. That is computer simulations. What computer simulations allow you to do is not to depend on formulas, but to to deploy an entire population of equations, have them interact with one another, and then you be, and then display it graphically in a computer so you can begin to discern if there are any patterns that begin to appear. Right? I'm currently writing, I'm finishing my new book on computer simulations, and it's precisely about that, about how once you get to a certain level, not even only with humans, with animals and plants, I mean, there are certain aspects of ecology that cannot be plotted in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way like this. Uh, the only way to actually discern patterns of becoming is by staging thought experiments in the computer. By throwing an entire population of equations or an entire population of little programs, have them interact with one another, and then weigh them out to see if a pattern emerges. If a pattern emerges, then you repeat the simulation, changing some of the, of the conditions, and see if the pattern still emerges, to see if it's robust, or if it's just an artifact. And then after running 100, simula 100 simulations with different values for the parameters, and the same pattern keeps coming up, then you know you've got something. Right? Now today, this was very, very difficult to do in the 90s, because in the 90s, the only computers that could run kind of simulations were supercomputers. They were only 12 or 20 in the United States. So if you were a scientist, you had to wait in line. 
will get a grant from either a fellow, you know, from either a private or a public organization, wait in line for your turn, run your little simulation, and you would go back with a videotape or something showing you some graphics or something, but then you would have to wait in line again, wait for the next grant, wait in line again. Today, any Mac with, uh, with, a, with a, a two processor Mac, whether the G5s or the new Intel chips, have the same power as the computer simulate, as the supercomputers of the 90s, which means that every scientist has now a supercomputer in their desktop, which means that the creatures that you can unleash to interact can now actually be intelligent. This is it's a, tip, it's a type of simulation called multi-agent systems, in which you create little artificial intelligence intelligent uh, creatures that you know are not intelligent in the full sense of the world. They cannot appreciate good literature or be moved by a poem or, or write or paint or anything like that. Say so they are, have very limited capacities, but they have capacities. So you can throw them, for instance, to trade with one another, to bargain and trade with one another. That's the only thing they know how to do, but they have that capacity. Right? Then you throw a thousand of them. And then you try to get, then you see, well, let's see what happens. Let's see, for instance, if the prices eventually reached a particular pattern from their bargaining and interacting with one another. And so now you can stage those simulations with intelligent agents and try to discover patterns from running them over and over and over again. In other words, the tools to investigate patterns of becoming in the more complex case of human beings are beginning to appear, but they are in their infancy. They are where mathematics was in the 17th century. Right? So you guys who are in your 20s, you know, you're going to get to live long enough of this century to see this revolution happening. I am unfortunately basically on my way out, so you know, I might as well just say goodbye and shoot myself. <laughs> I saw another hand. Yeah, yeah. Just a quick question. I was wondering if the term plastic and elastic apply to uh, nonlinear. Well, nonlinear, non yeah. Nonlinear, the word nonlinear, we'll see another, another, another sense of it later on tonight. Nonlinear was first coined for these guys, right? Because they are nonlinear, they are curvy. But yes, the moment you get to that plastic point, it's something that used to be linear. Now, this part of the, of the diagram is nonlinear. Before that point, the moment your, your friend removes his butt off the car, the dent bounces back. It doesn't become a permanent dent. You know, you say, hey, what are you doing? This is my car. You know, he takes his butt off and the dent just kind of like bounces back, which means that you go back to the same curve. After a certain amount of intensity, the dent becomes permanent. It doesn't matter whether he removes his butt, you will still be have left a permanent dent in your car, and that is a non a nonlinear. <coughs> Did I see any other hands? Yeah. Those look like plateaus. Is that part of where it came from? No, no. Well, this one is because plateaus are always plateaus of intensity. Maxima of intensity at which something happens. And this is a plateau, even though it doesn't look like a plateau, it is a plateau. It is the maximum of intensity after which something that was linear starts becoming in a non-linear way. So plateaus really refer to distributions of intensity. The intensity in this case is the intensity of the load. But we saw that there are all kinds of intensities. There are temperature, pressure, speed. There are colors, sounds, uh, aromas. There are intensities of humiliation, intensities of pride, intensities of love, intensities of hatred. So intensities are very many, but and they reach plateaus. You know, think of the intensity of grief. You know, some people lose a, 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 one of their sons, one of you know, one of their uh, daughters, or even their, their girlfriends die, and they take it so badly that they become, you know, say, I'm going to use a, a, the case of a male who loses his girlfriend. The guy doesn't bounce up, or, you know, doesn't bounce back after a certain period of grieving. He's now a broken man. And you can see that guy walking with the, with the head down and never kind of looking up and, and seeing, and, and, you can, and you can tell, wow, the intensity of the grief broke that guy. You know, it was like the suffering was so much that He's, like, he's now a broken person. You cannot inject joy into that guy 
By no means, he has now permanent sadness. He has reached a plastic point of grief, so to speak, where now the grief has left a permanent mark that now affects and colors his entire personality. He loses his friends, becomes a loner, he's never capable of starting a new relationship. Other people undergo grief in a more elastic way, say, in the sense that, yes, they mourn for a while and they perhaps maintain, you know, they miss the person that they lost and they will always cry a little bit when they, you know, a movie or a, or a piece of music or something reminds them of that person, but they bounce back. They bounce back, they get back into action, they continue writing their novel or they continue painting their painting, you know, and they, they might even make use of that sadness to, to, to give a new twist to the novel they were writing. I mean, there are some artists that are actually capable of using those intensities that no, would normally destroy a person in their work. And the same thing with alcoholism and a bunch of things. I mean, there's a, many, a particularly American novelists that have been very alcoholic from the beginning and they produce it fantastic works for a while, but then at some point the alcohol gets to them and they reach a breaking point where they, the talent just goes away. Right? So there are breaking points also in the case of subjective intensities. Guys, let's go and come back and four sharp.